Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 30. Then children were brought to him so that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. Then Jesus said, Leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. After putting his hands on them, he went on from there. Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother and love your neighbour as yourself. I've kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go, sell your belongings, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard that command, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I assure you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter responded to him, look, we've left everything and followed you, so what will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I assure you, in the messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters, father or mother, children or fields, because of my name, will inherit 100 times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, make sure uh, that you keep your Bibles open there. Uh, we'll also turn back to a bit on the Sermon on the Mount. There's a sermon outline there in your service sheets, and uh, there'll be an opportunity, God willing, to ask questions at the end. But let me turn to one of my favourite times of the year. Uh, around Australia Day, uh, I love seeing the new lamb ad from MLA. Meat and Livestock Australia. I don't know if you've noticed them, uh, but look them up on YouTube or the internet, however you want to do it. They're quirky. Uh, they poke fun at cultural sacred cows, no pun intended, and they're often quite thought-provoking. Uh, the ad that featured in 2023 took issue with the idea of being un-Australian and by virtue of that of what it means to be Australian. Uh, it asked us to think about what those terms mean why we use, misuse and overuse them. Uh, in essence, when you boiled it down, it was an ad asking us questions about belonging. Who belongs? How do you belong? And when you think about it, those questions are always with us, questions of belonging. Uh, when you walk into the school playground at the start of a new year, where do I belong? Maybe that happens each day. When you start a new sporting season, when you move to a new town, when you walk into a new workplace, when you receive or don't receive invitations on social media, do I belong? Who belongs? How do I work out whether I belong? How am I actually going to belong in this community? And inevitably when we ask those questions, we start asking questions about who I am. Why do I matter? Where do I fit? Uh, when Jesus came, he posed those very same questions. When you look at the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, it's really a list of who belongs, who's good enough for the family tree of Jesus. When Jesus preaches his first sermon in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it's about belonging. He's talking about a kingdom and who's in and who's not in and how you get in. And when Jesus comes and teaches his first group of followers on the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about the very same thing. What does it look like to belong in the kingdom of God? 
How do you get into the kingdom of God? How does that affect you? And as he does all of this, he's showing us that this is a kingdom unlike any other in the world. It's got a ruler who gets tired and needs to nap, who's fully God. It's established when the king of the kingdom is rejected and killed. The defining citizenship feature is making sure you've got a cross on your back. And its manifesto, well, it emphasises that the citizens are mourners who are not perfect, who are crippled by sin and yet called to obedience, all wrapped up with a bloke we're still raising questions about whose name is Jesus. It's unlike anything we've experienced in this world. It's a kingdom that focuses on outsiders and says you can come in not because you deserve it but because you depend on someone else. And so as Stephen pointed out, Jesus is walking towards the capital, Jerusalem, and all of these questions start to bubble up again. Who belongs and how do you belong? We're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you uh, for being able to sit here and read this good news biography of Jesus. Uh, Thank you for how different he is. Thank you for how bamboozling he is. Thank you for how he turns the world on its head. Father, help us to think about belonging today, belonging to his kingdom. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, We've been looking at uh, Matthew's good news biography of Jesus now for five years. This is our sixth chunk. Uh, Let me remind you of some key ideas to keep in mind as we return to it. Just four quick key ideas. First, this is a good news about outsiders coming inside. Outsiders coming inside. Outsiders are sinners. That's you, me, and every other human being. Outsiders are people who've set ourselves up against God. So we're outside his kingdom by nature. And that God has promised from the very earliest part of his revelation to bring those outsiders back in, to deal with human sin. And it will climax in a descendant from a bloke called Abraham and his name's Jesus. That's the first idea. Second idea, outsiders are brought in by being attached to Jesus. Outsiders are brought in by being attached to Jesus. He's everything we need to be and cannot hope to be. We are rebellious, Jesus obeys God. We're independent of God, Jesus depends upon God. We disobey God, Jesus obeys every word of God. In fact, he's every word of God in the flesh. He fulfills everything that God promised. And so all you need to do is to trust that he really is that bloke. Third, when Jesus comes in, he brings a kingdom. And when his kingdom comes, it meets all of our little kingdoms. We've got our little kingdoms, don't we? Our aspirations to rule. And when Jesus comes, the real king, he meets all of those little kingdoms and all of those desires and aspirations. That's why the biggest theme of this Good News biography is the kingdom of God. It's everywhere. It's the most repeated phrase in all of the Gospels in Matthew. The kingdom of God. It's right there from when John the Baptist starts speaking, when Jesus preaches his first sermon, when he hangs out with his disciples, even in today's passage. It's everywhere in the book. The kingdom of God. Here's a basic definition. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is when God comes with his word to change the world. When God comes with his word to change the world, it's brought in by Jesus. It's met by repentance. Our little kingdoms crumble and we realize they're not really as grand as we thought they were. It brings a community. It brings a rule. It brings a geography. And when you talk about kingdoms, there's always a ruler and subjects, isn't there? There are always people who are in and people who are not in. Being in that kingdom is about being connected to Jesus. And here's the fourth idea. It's remarkable how often Matthew 5 to 7 is repeated in the rest of this biography. It's it's scattered right throughout the passage. That Sermon on the Mount that we all know about, I, I even heard people talking about it at the show yesterday. It's everywhere. And you'll see it in today's passage. 
Well, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. At point two on the outline, look at verse 13. Then children were brought to him so that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Now, Jesus has been walking towards Jerusalem for a while. His disciples know that this is going to be an important moment, so please don't distract Jesus. Parents want to bring their kids to Jesus so he can lay his hands on them, welcome them, bring them into God's people. The disciples having none of this, so they rebuke the parents for having the temerity to bring the kids in. Would never happen here, would it? Have you ever seen it happen? How dare you bring the kids? Well, Jesus steps in, verse 14. Then Jesus said, leave the children alone. Don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. We know that verse, don't we? It's a corker. Leave the children alone. Don't stop the children from coming to me. The children are welcome. They're welcome. Jesus is having none of that high-handed behaviour of his disciples. And then, do you notice we're given a very clear reason? Because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. There's that phrase, kingdom of heaven, that repeated concept, and Jesus is making very clear who belongs in the kingdom. Who belongs in the kingdom. Not the first time he's spoken about this. If you go back to Matthew 18, 1 to 5, about a week earlier, Jesus says virtually the same thing. It's almost like the disciples have forgotten what was taught only a week ago. Amazing, isn't it? Those earlier words help us understand what Jesus is saying because this verse is often misunderstood and misapplied, isn't it? If you go back to Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is not saying that children are innately innocent. He's not saying that children are without sin. He's not saying that if you are connected to Jesus, you have to be childish. Please notice that what he is saying is that there is something about children and how they live life that defines what it means to be a citizen. If you go back to Matthew 18, verse 4, you'll see that he describes it as being humble. Put simply, Jesus is stating that to be in the kingdom of heaven is to be fundamentally dependent. That's what children are, aren't they? Children are always dependent. They never lose their label of children. And it's a fundamental confrontation of our sinful nature, isn't it? Because in our sin, what do we want to be? We want to be independent, don't we? We want to be God instead of God. And Jesus is actually saying, no, no, to be in the kingdom is to be dependent. It it captures what it means to enter into the kingdom. It means to repent, to turn from independence to dependence. And that's Jesus' fundamental call on his people. Are you dependent? Who belongs in the kingdom? The dependent people. The ones who are not independent of God. The ones who don't wallow in the independence of sin. The ones who go, actually, there is a bigger king than me who is far more significant. Who belongs in the kingdom of heaven? It's the dependent ones, the ones who depend on Jesus completely, wholeheartedly, lifelong, obediently. You see, there's no aspect of a child's life that's not dependent, is there? And that's the image Jesus is using. Well, just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Sounds like a dependent person, doesn't it? Do you notice the contrast? A young man has turned up. We'll find out that this young man is not just rich. He owns many possessions. And this young man turns up to Jesus after Jesus has just spent time with the children and says, what good must I do? Does that sound dependent to you? What good must I do? Jesus gently rebukes him. Look at verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus gently reminds him of his human nature. Good? (laughs) It's not you, my friend. You're an independent sinner, thinking you can earn your membership in God's kingdom. Jesus is very gentle with him, isn't he? 
There's only one who is good, and that's God himself. Uh, In fact, young man, getting into the kingdom is not a one-and-done achievement you can tick off. It's about entering into life that takes life to get used to. It's not easy for an independent person to grasp dependence, is it? Well, the young man doesn't seem to grasp what Jesus says. Do you notice how he responds there in verse 18? Just give me the ones I need to tick off. Which ones? And again, Jesus responds. Look there in verse 18. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour your father, your mother, love your neighbour as yourself. Familiar list, isn't it? It's an echo of the list from the Sermon on the Mount. But there are some striking things about this list. This is often the list we think we can tick off, isn't it? Until we read the Sermon on the Mount. Did you notice which commands Jesus didn't mention? And did you notice that these are all the commandments that we humans think we can achieve? The young man's response is striking, isn't it? Look there in verse 20. Oh, I've kept all these things the young man told him. What do I still lack? He's not listening, is he? But, but it's worthwhile considering this young man a little more closely. He's probably completed his apprenticeship. He's done well. He's managed to buy a tidy little home in the town he's grown up in. Perhaps he's even done it up. He's invested widely and now he's got all of the toys he needs to relax on a weekend. Probably a member of Rotor Act, comes from a good family, well-liked around town. It's the type of good, young, shiny man you want in your church, isn't he? Jesus stops being gentle in his rebuke, doesn't he? And now he speaks plainly in verse 21. If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go, sell your belongings, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Do you see the echo from the Sermon on the Mount? The issue is not good. (laughs) The issue is perfection. Perfection. Perfection is dependence upon Jesus for all of his perfection because we're sinners. And so Jesus wants this young man to confront and have stripped away from him everything that hinders his dependence, that fuels his independence. Jesus wants this young man to confront what he depends on, his many possessions. Jesus targets the source of his independence, and he commands him, put it aside, mate. Put it aside. Get rid of it. Have it stripped away so you can wholeheartedly depend upon Jesus. And the young man, he bursts into tears. He walks away. He's grieved (laughs) because he wants to stay independent. He doesn't want to lose his toys. The command is very clear, isn't it? And the grief is very deep. At this moment, he doesn't belong in the kingdom of heaven because he will not depend on Jesus. Uh, Let me be very clear here about what Jesus is not commanding. Jesus is not saying that to be in the kingdom, you need to be dirt poor, own nothing, and exist in a commune. What Jesus is doing is exposing the thing that fuels this man's independence. And what is it? It's his materialism. It's his materialism. And in fact, as Matthew writes this, he writes in such a way that he invites us with his language not to stand with Jesus, but to stand with the young man, to stand next to him. Because just like him, we have many possessions, don't we? Uh, Jesus summarises what's taken place uh, in, in quite a sharp way. I'm at point four on the outline. Look there at verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, so the young man is gone. Now Jesus turns to his disciples. I assure you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a noodle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, uh, let me be blunt here. Forget what you've heard about noodle gates, Jerusalem, and camels with big loads. Jesus wants us to get the hyperbole here. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a noodle. That's what Jesus wants you to hear. It is impossible. A camel can't do it. And I want to push it a little further because I think Jesus wants us to push a little further in the context. Whilst the example is about wealth and materialism, the heart is about independence. It is hard for an independent person from God to go through the eye of a noodle. It's hard because they rely on their possessions. They rely on their uni degrees. They rely on their pool room. They rely on their achievements, their family heritage, their good deeds. Such an independent person won't go through the eye of a noodle. The disciples are astonished. Look there in verse 25. And notice they're not talking about rich people, the disciples. They're talking about humans. Then who can be saved? The kingdom of heaven is going to be sparsely populated if the independent people aren't getting in. And Jesus responds very clearly with a verse we rightly remember. But Jesus looked at them, the disciples, and said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That is such a good and comforting phrase, isn't it? (laughs) Because it turns our belonging to who? To God. God is the one who can bring us into his kingdom. That's the essence of dependence, isn't it? turning from yourself and being your own God and relying upon God and what he's done in Jesus Christ alone. And when God brings that dependence, gee, it's good. Gee, it's guaranteed. It is true and real. And that is such a good comfort. But do you notice what's confronting? What might God have to do to make you dependent? What might God have to strip away? What might God have to remove? How low might God have to bring you to make you dependent? You see, the dependence of the kingdom is not half-hearted. Not only when we're in stress. It's not just one of a number of options. As we saw with the young men and the children... It is complete and total and wholehearted. And only God can bring that about. And Peter understands that and he is really worried. Look at verse 27. Then Peter responded to him, well, hang on, look, we've left everything and followed you, so what will there be for us? Peter is a living, breathing example of what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, What's it going to look like for us? Uh, Peter's forgotten that first training session. But seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be provided. You'll have what you need. You'll have what you need. Don't worry about it. And again, Jesus emphasizes that. Look there in verse 28. Jesus said to them, I assure you, There is nothing more certain than this. In the Messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who follow me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who's left houses, brothers, sisters, father or mother, children or fields, because of my name, will receive a 100 times more and will inherit eternal life. In the future, you'll be on the right side of history. In the future, you'll be with the king. In his kingdom, saved by the one you depended upon. And in the here and now, well, you'll have eternal life, but in the here and now, you'll have everything you need. In the community of God's mob, you'll have the mothers that you lacked, the fathers that you missed, the children who've turned away from Jesus, the resources, the provisions, more than you can imagine. Jesus starts with the imagery of family and finishes with it, doesn't he? Because of his name, the dependent will have everything they need. And then he summarizes it. 
but many who are first will be last and the last first. In essence, what does it mean to belong? The first who are the independent will be reduced and the last who are the dependent will be welcomed into the kingdom. Who belongs in the kingdom of God? I'm at point five on the outline. Who belongs in the kingdom? (laughs) It's the dependent ones. Those who know their nature as sinners and throw themselves completely, wholeheartedly on Jesus, who he is and what he's done. The independent, those who depend on anything other than Jesus for life, security and the future, they don't belong. They don't belong. And only God can bring you to dependence. Only God can bring you to dependence, to the dependence that is a sign of being in his kingdom. And that is wonderfully comforting, but it will be confronting. So let me finish with four questions, just to get our minds ticking in each of our circumstances. First question, am I dependent on Jesus or independent of him? Am I dependent on Jesus or independent of him? Second question, what does dependence look like and how do I feed my independence? What does dependence look like and how do I feed my independence? You see, a question like that will touch on our decision-making, won't it? And help us to consider what we decide daily. Third question, how might God have to act on me? How might God have to act in me? To bring about my dependence on Jesus. To bring about my dependence on Jesus. And fourthly, what does a dependent community look like now? Because that's where he finishes. Striking that Jesus finishes with the community, doesn't he? Uh, It it touches on who we think belongs. (laughs) When people walk through the door, who, who belongs? It also gives us two very clear indications. Jesus picks up the idea that children are welcome, aren't they? Uh, Not accommodated, they're incorporated. Not accommodated, they're incorporated. Uh, That affects how we relate to each other because as we deal with children, we're actually affirming the example that Jesus talked about, about dependence and belonging, aren't we? And do you notice too, Jesus gives us a very concrete example that God's mob is a community of mutual dependence. It's not a vehicle for my rugged individualism. It's a vehicle where we're dependent on each other and and that will affect our decision making about our gatherings, about how we respond to those we're with, about how we look at those we're with. Are they my child? Are they my auntie? Are they my uncle? Is this my father? Is this my mother? Is this my family? Who belongs in the kingdom of God? The dependent ones. How hard is it for the independent to enter the kingdom of God? Well, find a needle and a camel. And who will bring us to dependence? That'll be God alone. That's wonderfully comforting, but it could be confronting. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Jesus. Father, thank you that he is more vivid than an MLA. Uh, The examples that he uses uh, are really clear and plain. Uh, He is gentle but plain. He is kind and loving but firm. Uh, He makes us understand that the dependent, the ones who are dependent on him, who know their sin before you, are the ones brought in by Jesus into the kingdom of heaven. Father, forgive my independence, forgive our independence, and we pray that this truth about dependence being the defining feature of citizenship will define who we are in this town as we proclaim this kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Any quick questions? Cappy. Listen, if you watch Australian Parliament, this is what's called a Dorothy Dixer, okay? Go, Cappy, what's your, a bit of clarification? 
about verse 28. Look at verse 28. Uh, I assure you in the Messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who follow me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, so two questions you've got to quit very quickly ask. Does that mean on judgment day I'll face 13 judges? Jesus plus the 12 disciples. Well, no, it isn't because there's one judge. Who's that? That's Jesus. Uh, they will be enthroned with Jesus. How will they be enthroned with Jesus? Secondly, they'll be enthroned with Jesus because they are with that throne. Okay. So on that last day, as you walk in, you'll see the dependent and the independent. Okay. If you are dependent on Jesus, you're on the right side of history. You're with the throne of the king who saved you. If you choose to be independent, you are on the wrong side of history. And I think that's what he's picking up with the 12 tribes of Israel because at this point, what are the 12 tribes of Israel plotting to do with Jesus? To kill him. Okay. So does that answer your question? If you are dependent on Jesus, you can look forward to a glorious future of being on the right side of history. If you are independent of Jesus, you'll be on the wrong side of history. Does that clarify it? 